Welcome to the HIV podcast. Each week we focus on a person, historical event or pop culture moment linked to HIV and explore the story of what actually happened. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess. And between us, we've been working in the field of HIV for 40 years. Our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. I always forgot to say it then. I was waiting for you. Welcome to the HIV podcast. Ooh, who's that? Who is that indeed? I'm back, baby. She's back. Here I am. Yeah, but actually, who is this? It's me. Your, I was going to say your longtime life partner. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that's not true, is it? <laughs> that's all I need to just end this relationship. Um, it is so nice to see your face. It's so good to be back. Oh, it's good to have you back because you've had a couple of weeks off. So we've had a couple of stand-ins. Yes, you have. And by the way, can I say, because I've listened, absolutely fantastic. Massive thank you to Chantel and also to Zoe. And another big thank you to Zoe because she's been doing the editing while I've not been here. And she's been doing such an amazing job. So thank you so, so much, Zoe, for that. And thank you, Chantel, for standing in. They were amazing, weren't they? They were. And, and we sort of put them on the spot a bit because I was off. And then, unfortunately, I had to be off for a little bit longer than we'd planned for... So that is why it was all a bit action stations. But luckily we have an amazing team who were just leapt right in there with you, didn't they? They absolutely did. A ma- bit too much, I feel. I think Chantelle likes the limelight. Oh, she, 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 do you reckon she'll be wrestling me off? <laughs> yeah. That'll be it. That'll be it. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what? I've come back at literally the best time because how amazing is this week for us? Share the news, Jess so excited so on Tuesday night you may or may not have seen our social media obviously I was straight on there because I was so excited but we found out there was a, a live stream of the Arias the audio and radio industry awards so they were announcing their nominees their shortlists for each category and we only bloody made a category which category are you in Jess right we are in which oh I'm, I'm blown away we are in the impact award category so it says this category recognizes radio and audio programming that's done something to make a difference to society how amazing is that oh that is amazing oh my gosh now just to get this clear because you know you can't expect me to know everything jess these awards are a big deal right i bet it's such a big deal I'm, okay I was actually... tell me why tell me why so I was shooketh that we got them. So as we chatted about a minute ago, they're, they're a little bit like the bas- the Bastards? <laughs> what are they? The Bastards of sort of audio, radio, podcasting. And we're actually the only people in our category. We don't have any kind of radio station, media company, production company backing us. We are the only ones that are just this little people just doing it all for ourselves in our category. Like this is huge. This is really a massive accolade for like I said, the whole industry of radio, to give you a little example of the breakfast nominee category, you've got Zoe Ball, Greg James, Chris Evans. I mean, huge, huge, absolute juggernauts of audio and radio in there. So this is how big it is. Yeah. So we're doing it for the independent podcasters, aren't we? Hell yes, we are, because we always enter these. And I know we've talked about it before in here. And then, you know, you think, oh, I'm never going to get anywhere. Everyone's so huge that I'm up against. And they have all this clout. And because they do have money, let's be honest, you know, if you're getting backed by a radio station or a media company, you're being supported by a whole production team. Our production is Yumi and Zoe. So it's unbelievable that we've been recognised in this category. Like just to be nominated is unreal. This is literally just for all our amazing podcast community, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. This is, well, yeah, it's all down to them. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so Hope much for listening. Hopefully do you proud. Yeah, and staying with us because literally we're nothing. We're literally just me and Sarah having a rubbish chat without you lot. So thank you so much for being on board. Why do I sound like I'm accepting the award? I'd like to thank everyone. How- well, it could, to be fair, it could be the only opportunity we get. This is, you know me, this is the part I like where we live in hope because we don't know if, you know, if we've won or lost. So this is the this is the bit I like. Oh, really? I think oh. I'd like the ceremony the most. The ceremony. Do you know who's um, hosting? Ramesh Ranganathan and Alice Levine are hosting the Aria ceremony. It's going to be a good night. It really is. Like, uh, what an amazing time for me to come back in. <laughs> it's just brilliant. Now, I can take no credit for any of this because you do everything and I, I'm the thinker. We all know this. I'm not the doer. <laughs> I hope Sean's not listening. He's like, you do everything, Jess. I do nothing. No, that's not what she's saying. No, 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 no. That's no, let's rephrase that. I do some stuff, 
but I don't do entries to podcast awards because it involves submitting audio, doesn't it? I mean, I wouldn't have the first idea how to do that. So what what type of audio did you submit? Well, I love that you've asked this, Sarah, because I it was actually really fun. So you there's a certain time frame that you have to, you know, you can only include episodes from this certain time frame. And we could choose up to five clips, but all of them put together could only be up to 15 minutes. And actually, I'm going to play you one of the clips that I chose to go in oh. because... It's so poignant and it still resonates so much. So here we go. This is one of the clips I included in our entry. People are very quick to criticise positive people. We know this. And I think I've said it before. They're all missing the point. So we're all responsible for our own sexual health. And we all have a duty to ensure we don't pass on any STI to anybody else. And if we all know our status, then HIV transmission rates will reduce. Because it's not people who have already been diagnosed and have an undetectable viral load that are spreading it. It's people that don't know their status. And that's kind of the reframing bit. It's not, I don't want people to point the finger. Well, actually, that's not true. I do, because it does make me really cross. But we vilify people with HIV. We make them scared to have sex and nervous to be honest about their status. And it all needs to change to a world where we're all adults where we all know our sexual health status, where we don't judge people that contract STIs and where we're kind to those that live with them because we recognise that in getting tested, that person did a good thing that protected the wider community. People with HIV should be celebrated, especially those that take their meds every day and are undetectable. They're the good eggs in our society. They're doing everything right. They're looking after their own health. They're also looking after everyone else's health as well. Oh, I feel so much better and I've got that off my chest. Are you like, and seen? I, I'm going. Yes. No, you, you're so right. I, if this whole thing is just you doing soapbox speeches, let's go. Loved it. Okay, good. I do feel, I feel a lot lighter now. It's been, it's been brewing for weeks, I tell you. Well done you, that needed to be said. Well, look, let's address the shouty people that we've had on our social media and that are out there who like to point the finger and let's remind them of three things okay so number one people that don't know their hiv status that you need to be pointing the finger at because they are the ones that are potentially spreading the virus you're not going to know who they are individually because you know no one's ever bragging are they about not being tested so start with yourself get yourself tested you can brag about that and then you can encourage others to follow your lead love number one yes Excellent. Number two, pointing fingers at positive people is creating stigma that doesn't need to be created. So we have got enough on our plates, me and Jess, trying to continually mop up the ongoing stigma from the 80s. We don't need anybody needlessly adding to it. Yes, absolutely. I'm pointing at you now, Sarah. I'm finger pointing at you. Yes. You are. Already clearing up this big old mess over here of a tombstone that caused all this you know, horrendousness. We don't need new new pockets of stigma, thank you very much. Especially when we've moved on so far. Exactly. Come and join me on my very high soapbox. Oh, I'm there. I am there. Okay, thirdly, stop being scared of positive people and educate yourself. Because all that happens when you start pointing the finger is that you make yourself look really silly. You're not going to win because you're up against the most awesome community in the world. And I stand by that fact the HIV community is amazing. So come and join us. Word about you equals you and the importance of testing. Turn your angry energy into positive energy by helping us because Jess and I could really use a bit of that at the moment. We really could. I mean, it's just, but it's not just the two of us, is it? It's our whole community that's so amazing that we know are listening and sharing, but we need more, 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 more. Absolutely. We need to grow our community And channel all that anger that people have into kind of positive energy. And, you know, imagine if the people that trolled us with the comments that really don't make sense and really highlight their lack of education, imagine if they use that energy to spread the word with us. Oh, God, it'd be amazing. It would, but I don't like them. So although that was a long clip, I actually wanted to play that because I think it's still so important and that was from our changing the narrative episode that we did but yeah so it's clips like that that we enter and obviously we have to enter blurb and things around the podcast I'm just I'm blown away today 
Good. So you should be. Well done, Jessica. Excellent, excellent work. Well, do you know what? Well done to you too, because you are right here with me and you do prepare the episodes. I cannot take credit for that. <laughs> well, shall we get on? Yeah, let's got do any it. News? No, that's all the news I had. And I actually have absolutely no idea what we're doing today. In honour of the Olympic year that this is. End of July, Jess. That's when we need to be watching. Right, today. okay. I'm continuing with my HIV and sport series. When did you start that? I did football a couple of weeks oh, ago. Oh, okay. It's a series. It's a series. I like it. I'm with you. I'm on but board. interspersed with other episodes right. because we have got so much content at the moment, which is amazing, um, and lots of lovely people that we've interviewed. And so we're kind of into So it'll be a, a theme up until the actual Olympics when I will be unavailable for two weeks. Just letting you know now. Just locked off. That's fine. That's fine. We'll give you that time. Sarah, okay. if you couldn't tell, big fan of the Olympics. Huge fan of the Olympics. So I will go into my own lockdown and you'll, you'll be able to contact me when it's all finished. Okay. So I'm assuming this is Olympics and HIV, not just about... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's about... It's not actually about the Olympics. It's just <laughs> sport, different sports. So we're looking at people who have uh, sports people with HIV. Right. And this week, I've written down here that we're looking at swimming. We're not looking at swimming. We're looking at diving. Oh, yeah, that's not the same. Well, they both take place in a swimming pool, right? I know, but you could say that, I don't know, that that, what's that dancey horse one and then horse ra- racing? They're like, they both take place on horses, but they're not the same thing, are they? Oh, what dressage. Do you know what I wish? I wish they did that to better tunes. You know, like like garage music, for example. I'd just like to see a horse absolutely losing its shit. You know, I got in my head Little instantly. Little hooves going. Instantly, I thought of, you know, Black Eyed Peas. I got a feeling. And then the horse stuck. <laughs> With the blinkers on. Just yeah. like, oh yeah, I'm here for this. They need to listen to you, Sarah. Maybe you need, we need to get you on the Olympic board somehow. Yeah. Sebastian Coe, I'm coming for you. So, water diving. Diving, yes. Just Oh, I shouldn't say just diving. That's derogatory, isn't it? We're looking at HIV and diving. Okay, well, look, if we Google HIV and swimming, do you know what comes up? Millions of articles about how you can't catch HIV from a swimming pool. That's why I've gone for diving. And we're featuring an American Olympic diver who contracted HIV not from a swimming pool. His name is Greg Laganis. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him, yeah. He was 16 when he took part in the 1976 Montreal Olympics. Imagine being that young and being an Olympian. I know. My son's 16. I've never felt more disappointed, Jess, to be honest. Go in there and say that to him. Just feel after this episode. (laughs) What are you doing with your life? Montreal Olympics. He's 16 years old. He places second in the tower event. It doesn't mention the height, but I know that it goes up to 10 metres. And if there's one sport that I can't really watch in the Olympics, it's that. So it just makes me feel a bit queasy. It's so high up. I just don't think I could ever just kind of dive off it. I mean, I get queasy. Well, I don't get queasy. I find falling off a curb traumatic. I know they got cope well with a 10 metre high board. Especially because it's wobbly. That's what I don't love. I don't think the 10 metre one is wobbly. I think that's solid concrete. The oh, springboard okay. is springy. This is oh, a yeah. good action, isn't it? Do you yep. like this? Yeah. I like how we're just describing diving now. <laughs> yeah, like we're the experts. <laughs> just explaining it to everyone. Yeah, this is what this is why we've been nominated for an aria. Yeah. <laughs> So he's in the 1976 Olympics, like I said. Next Olympics were the 1981s in Moscow. I'm giving you a little history of the Olympics at the same time. Now, America boycotted them because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So he couldn't attend, but he did win two titles at the World Champs in 1982. And he was the first diver in a major international meeting to get a perfect score of 10 from all seven judges. He's very good. Tens across the board. Quite literally, yes. Next Olympics, 1984, Los Angeles, my favourite Olympics. I don't know anyone that's got a favourite Olympics. Oh, come on. LA was amazing. Very glamorous, very glitzy, amazing athletes. Anyway, that was the summer I spent avidly watching TV. And I noted down each day what medals have been awarded. And to... <laughs> Really? Oh, my God, you're so into it. How old were you then? Twelve. Oh, Sarah. That what was a not summer. Playing. Can, you, can you come out to play? Nah. Watching the Olympics, mate. I know. And I made like little tiny kind of medals out of coloured paper so I could put a hat, I could do like a medal table, like a little Olympic geek. Oh, well, you know, creative though, at least. Bordering on quite sad though, Jess. When I look back now, I was like, 
What's going on? <laughs> so anyway, LA Olympics. He won medals, gold medals in the springboard and the tower diving events. Two more golds in the world champs two years later. He is a diving genius. So we've moved forward again, 1988. We're at the Seoul Olympics. Not my favourite. Oh, you didn't like that one? No. Okay. Was it as good? During the preliminary rounds, Greg hits his head on the springboard. Oh. I know. Oh, well, that turns my stomach a bit. Mine too. By having concussion from that and his injury needing four stitches carries on. Seriously? Mm-hmm. So that's we- the difference between a high-class athlete and us. I'd be like, no, I'm stopping. I've got an ouchie. There's no more diving for me today. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. He just, with a concussion and everything. Yeah, with concussion. Truly that's dangerous. I think it probably is. But we're in the 80s. Don't have health and safety. And his next dive after bumping his head earned him the highest single score of the qualifying round. Can you believe all the other competitors who don't have concussion, who haven't hit their head, didn't do as well as him? He is the goat of diving, isn't he? Like, unreal. It's amazing. Oh, how demoralising for everyone else thinking, ah, banged his head. It's not going to be as good now. I've got a chance of yeah, yeah, this. N- yeah, now we've got a shoe in. No, yeah. sadly not. No. It's like the Terminator. Yeah, absolutely like the Terminator. So in the finals, I mean, he won the gold medal. Of course he did. And he won the gold in the 10 metre tower, tower finals as well. Well done him. Moving forward, because I think he's kind of, so. I mean, I don't know how long a diving career is, but you cannot maintain that level of expertise forever. So we're fast forwarding, fast forwarding on from that to 1995. He publicly announces that he is HIV positive and that he'd been diagnosed six months before the Seoul Olympics. So, of course, what does everyone focus on? His decision to not disclose his status when he banged his head at the Seoul Olympics and bled into the diving pool. It's full of chlorine. Well, exactly. So, you know, everyone else obviously is diving into that pool as well. And Greg's talked about the ordeal. So the ordeal was traumatic. He's hit his head executing a dive, but more traumatic because he's absolutely paralysed with fear that he would infect another competitor or the doctor that treated him. So this makes his achievement of getting the highest score after this happened even more remarkable. Now, the CDC, love the CDC, Centre for Disease Control and Infection, uh, a spokesman from there at the time said, there's just no risk the blood would have diluted in the water instantly. I mean, it's an enormous pool of water. Yeah. Plus, as you say, chlorine kills HIV. I mean, I'm not surprised. So, so let's, you know, start with that. I'm not surprised that that's what everyone was bothered about. But how depressing for him. I know. I know. I think, yeah, people always focus on the things that aren't really important. Mm. And I know what's going to happen. I know someone now is going to contact us and say, well, if chlorine kills HIV, why can't we use it to cure people? If you are one of those people, remember when Donald Trump thought bleach could cure people of COVID, you're in the same ballpark. Yeah. Please don't be using chlorine in any way to try to cure HIV. It will not. So two very different things we're talking about there. We're talking about if blood goes into a swimming pool, what happens versus chlorine is a cure, which it is not. Yeah. Let's just inject everyone with that. Get rid of the HIV. Brilliant. Someone's going to take that. Someone's going to take that as a soundbite. Literally. <laughs> That'll be it. And he'll be like, no. So uh, the CDC, they also tried to put people's minds at rest by explaining that skin is an effective barrier to HIV. So unless anyone else in that competition had been diving into the pool with an open wound, and let's be honest, top class athletes covered in open wounds and open sores, aren't they? They're not going to contract it. So even if you cannot get over the fact that it's a massive pool of chlorinated water, you know, your skin is protecting you. But I think people have that paranoia. I think once that paranoia is there, once that irrational fear, even though someone is telling you you cannot contract, they can't even comprehend that, that it's like, no, it, I wouldn't be able to contract anyway. Like mm. you're saying, because the skin is about, they just cannot see that. It's why we still hear about, oh, the handshakes and toilet seats and all that rubbish. I can't believe that still still goes around. There must be people in the world who are just absolutely terrified of a public loose seat. Yes, I think there are. I mean, and not for the same reasons like I am and the snake coming up it. But, you no, know, I, no. yeah, we've heard that before. I've heard that from when people come and test with us. And not just around HIV, around other STIs too, that that's probably where they've contracted you know, whatever STR. It's a, no, no, no. Not contracting things from toilet seats. Oh, my God. 
just think people everywhere just hovering, hovering above the sea. I've done it before in a public toilet that was yeah. questionable. It's good for your leg muscles. Yeah, I, I do a hover, but that's normally, you know, like on a train where it's horrendous and it like the seat is just covered in liquid and we all know what it is. Like, yeah, you're having a hover because I don't want to sit in someone else's, you know, urine. Quite yeah. frankly, Sarah, nothing to do with STIs. Yeah, no, I'm the same. So I think, yeah, it's like if you go to a public toilet, like I was going to say outside then, just in the park, just, you know, flower bed does me. Is, is that what you're calling a public toilet these days? Yeah. <laughs> just a bush. If it's out in the public domain, it's fair game for me. <laughs> if you're caught short, you got to go. <laughs> they, they used to get like toilets that were like little concrete kind of buildings and yes. absolutely freezing in winter. No one wants to sit on a seat that's icy cold. And it was always metal. The yes. toilet seat was always metal. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the ones you mean. Like you're saying, in a park or something. Always very creepy and sinister. Yeah. And Not the door would never way. shut and you'd have your hand on the door. Oh, yeah. Hovering. Yeah. I'd always have two kids with my own kids, actually. Not, not just random <laughs> kids I picked up in the park. <laughs> it's one. But yes, yeah, it's, it's the hand out, the bum right back hover, isn't it? Trying yeah. to sort of keep that arm out. Just It's really hard for me because I'm so short. And my arm is so short. <laughs> arms don't reach. They don't reach the door. So I have to have my arm out ready that if someone opens that door, it's just going to hit my hand and I'll be like, occupied. <laughs> Middle class. <laughs> so in occupied, I'd be like, get out. Someone is in here. Oh, right. <laughs> no. really? oh, it's like some hideous yoga pose, isn't it? Yes, it really yeah, is. Like yeah, see, say, if I had to legs. do that, I'm then coming out, finding a seat, gathering my thoughts yeah. and having a rest. It is, yeah, it is traumatic. I'm not a fan of a public toilet. I've actually been known when I've been out to go home to go to the toilet. Oh, you were going to say, just go behind a bush. No, no, I'm not you. No, all of that's my worst nightmare. I'd rather come <laughs> home and then go back out again. Yeah, no, 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 not for me. People in my local park are used to me just popping up out of a bush. <laughs> like, right, where are we at? Back to Greg. I don't want to... Tr- detract from his trauma um so when he got his diagnosis he thought it was a death sentence so we're going back to the kind of 80s aren't we yeah Mm. so you you would and he genuinely thought that he would just go home kind of lock the doors uh, and just wait to die essentially that i wish we didn't hear that quite so often Mm. It's just so common, isn't it, that people felt like that way? And he did disclose to his coach, uh, but his coach thought that if the Olympic Committee knew an athlete had HIV, then he just wouldn't be allowed to compete. Coach also knew that diving posed no risk to other athletes. But after the accident, Greg is kind of really unsure about what to do. Should he then disclose? Should he not? Like straight afterwards, I'm talking about. And obviously, you'd be a bit confused. You'd be disorientated, I think. That is such a high pressure situation as well. You're there to compete. It's your entire career. Yeah, absolutely. But him and his coach both knew that if, you know, it's a very closely guarded secret, if they suddenly disclose that he's got HIV, it's going to send the entire competition into disarray. And actually, I think they felt that wasn't fair for the other competitors. Yeah. So the best thing to do is just to kind of keep quiet. They know they can't put anyone at risk. Um, Their only concern was that the Olympic doctor who stitched him up didn't wear gloves. Well, why didn't he wear gloves? I don't know. Well, it gets the 80s, isn't it? Health and safety. Oh, it's the Wild West, isn't it? And that doctor has actually said since, because when all of this came out, they tracked him down and said, were you worried? Were you at risk? And he's like, no. You know, transmission is extremely rare, even in contact sports. I wasn't at risk at all. Perfect. Love him. Yeah. So now, decades later, he's still one of the most well-known divers in the world. He was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1993. You love swimming. That's so for you, I do train. love swimming. Oh, I, do you know what? I'm actually an all right diver as well. I'm not going to lie to you, Sarah. I'm no... Oh, fan. I would pay money to see this, really. In a few years. But yeah, no, I was used to... Yeah, I used to do a bit of diving. I don't mind. Power or springboard? More springboard. So I was more the jumping and the that one, yeah. Oh, my God, on your tippy toes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was actually... Like, I didn't love diving as much as swimming like general swimming. So I used to spend a lot of my time in the diving pool, diving to the bottom to touch the bottom because you had deep diving pools. Yeah. That was always my favourite thing to do. That's what I spent most of my time doing, just being able to hold my breath long enough that I could swim all the way to the bottom and touch the bottom and go back up. You would make a good free diver. Uh, Do you know I really would? Get down to the south coast and you free dive for scallops. It's my favourite food, Jess. See what you can find. Also, no, scallops don't have pearls in them, do they? Do they? No, it's oysters. Well, find some of them too. We can make money out of that. 
Uh, anyway, right, decades later, very happy to say that Greg is healthy, undetectable, and he's just living his life. And he says now, you know, I never dreamed that this day would be possible. In the early days, I thought I was going to die. And now when he's asked about disclosing his status, he says, well, you know, I hope at some level it's helped advance Americans' acceptance of those with HIV. And he reasons, and this I think makes perfect sense. He says, some people don't think that AIDS has touched their lives. A lot of people saw me at the Olympics. They were cheering for me. So all of those people can't say that they've not been affected by AIDS. So clever. So clever. So it's just like when you did, you brought to us fame, wasn't it? And Greece to show people if you have watched these films you have been affected in some way by HIV. My God, he is so right. And also, I actually think it's amazing to go, okay, he was living with HIV, super fit athlete, absolutely killing it in his, you know, diving domain, best diver at the time, to show that healthy side of HIV. It's not all what people thought, you know, that imagery of, you know, people possibly ill or dying or being very thin back in the 80s and 90s. No, no, no. Think HIV, think Greg Luganis. Absolutely. So there you go. That wraps up this episode on HIV and diving. That was amazing. I just think, what a brave person. And I know a bit more about the Olympics. Oh, yeah. See, it's worth it just for that, isn't it? Yeah. I only cared when it was in, in London. I'm like a real fair weather fan. I'm like, I'm I'm only on board if it was right here. Try it. Paris is not far away. Try and get is. into it this summer. If you want to skip the first week, which is the lesser sport. Oh, <laughs> What 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 are we talking for lesser sports? So the second week is generally the athletics, which is what I'm here for. All athletics, track and field, amazing. The first week is all the other sports, which actually is still pretty cool because you can learn about sports that you just would not normally see on television. And this year, I'm sure they've the new sport they're introduced in, I'm sure it's breakdancing. What? See, then I would be on board. Oh, well, there you go. Honestly, I once had a How to Break Dance DVD. I swear to God, this is true. And I was living in my flat. (laughs) It had these enormous windows, right? It was above a parade of shops, this flat. Anyway, so I've got my How to Break Dance DVD on. Bear in mind, I'm not actually that young. You're going to imagine that I'm like 12. I know I'm living in a flat. So I wasn't. I was in my early 20s, okay? And and I'm learning how to moonwalk and also how to like pop and lock. But what I've done is leave the curtains open and it's at night. And then I spot some people just laughing at me. <laughs> watching me. Just, oh, it was awful. But I can moonwalk now. Can you? Yeah, I'll teach you when I see you next. Oh, well, maybe. Oh, it's probably too late for you to submit your entry for the Olympics. Yeah, it probably is. But you know what? Maybe we could moonwalk down the uh, little carpet at the Aria, Sarah. Flinging out red ribbons, sticking them oh. all over everyone. Yes, I love that idea. Let's give it a go. Yes, breaking will yep. feature at the Paris Olympics along with new sports such as surfing. I mean, they're not new, are they? But they're new to the Olympics. Skateboarding and sport climbing. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. The skateboarding one will be nuts. And surfing is so crazy, isn't it? When you, oh, wow. Okay, well, that's actually. I don't think they're new sports. I'm sure the last Olympics I watched had skateboarding in it. Didn't have, I, I thought they did BMXing. Maybe they changed it. Oh, up. BMXing is pretty cool as well. I will try to get on board, but I can't guarantee it. And did you say it's in July? Yeah, end of July. Yeah, so I don't know if you remember, we're literally busy nearly every weekend in July with ten attending 10,000 Pride events. Whoa. Oh, no. You're literally going to be at a Pride stall, I can see it, with some headphones in watching your phone. I always get sick that time of year. Building up to it. Feel yeah. something coming on for sort of the end of July kind of time. Yeah. Like a tickle in my throat that might appear. Scratchy there. throat. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Fever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Building up to that. Building yeah. up to that. I'm going to go and just tell some more people today. I've literally told about three people today about the Arias who didn't really care. I might pop down to Waitrose. Let them know. <laughs> Why not? Well, if you're going to let them know, see if they want to sponsor a couple of episodes. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a, yeah, very good idea. I love it. Okay, wonderful. Well, amazing to be back. Can't believe the Arias. What a bloody day. Thanks for listening to the HIV podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can now also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the HIV podcast for behind the scenes insights and video. The HIV podcast is produced by Thames Valley Positive Support.